friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vice Chancellor's Lecture Series at SOAS. Uh, this is the sixth or seventh lecture series that we're having for the year, and it's probably going to be the final one. And it's really on the financing of higher education. A common view in the higher education sector, from academics to unions, vice chancellors and students, is that universities in the UK are in a financial crisis. Student fees have not increased in over 10 years, despite external financial pressures. Financial experts now say that the government's underestimation of inflation means students have less uh, spent on their teaching than at any other time since fees tripled in 2012. The tension between the financial reliance on international students versus government pressure to restrict and reduce immigration numbers places even greater pressure on university finances. Many universities, about a third, face the reality of restructuring, the closure of departments, the inadequate support for students and the nature of international fees is the result of a lack of financial stability. At this lecture series, Professor Shitich Kapoor, Vice Chancellor and President of King's College London, and Professor Nicholas Barr, Professor of Public Economics at the London School of Economics, will, work, will, will speak to me and discuss solutions and challenges about what in essence is a broken operational model for higher education in the UK. We will ask how to create a more solid financial footing for universities. Is free higher education possible? And if so, on what terms? What is the appropriate mix, if any, between fees and government subsidy? We will also ask questions on international fees asking what should this be mechanism be by which to cross-subsidize domestic fees and research? What about the morality of draining resources from the global south to finance the domestic obligations of the global north? Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our two speakers. Firstly, a very, well, a very big thank you to both of them for being willi willing to participate in this conversation. Professor Shitich Kapoor returned to lead King's College London in June 2021 after four years at the University of Melbourne, where he was Dean and Assistant Vice Chancellor Health for the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. And he was Interim Deputy Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor International. During his time in Melbourne, Professor Kapoor significantly increased the educational footprint of the Faculty of Medicine dentistry and health sciences, introducing innovative models of learning, increasing both research income and impact while doubling philanthropic support. Professor Kapoor is globally recognized for his research on understanding psychosis and antipsychotic treatment and has received many awards and honorary fellowships, including the honors of, of distinguished fellow of the American Psych Psychiatric Association Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK, Fellow of the Academy of Health and Medical Sciences in Australia, and Fellow of King's College London. Welcome, Shitich. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, professor Nicholas Barr is a professor in public economics at the London School of Economics. The heart of his work is an exploration of how market failure both explain and justify the existence of welfare states. His policy work includes periods at the World Bank and the IMF. Since the mid-1980s, he has been active in the debate on higher education finance. He and his colleague Ian Crawford have been described as the architects of the 2006 reforms in England. He is also involved in pension policy, including advice to the government of China, and as a member of a presidential commission on reform of the pension system in Chile. He is the author of numerous articles and author editor of over 20 books, including The Economics of the Welfare State, Financing Higher Education, Answers from the UK 
in 2005 with Ian Crawford and pension reform, a short guide in 2010. Welcome to you, Nicholas. Uh, the way we're going to co uh, proceed, colleagues, is I'm going to give each of our speakers 10 minutes to say a few introductory remarks about how they understand the challenge, some, a little bit of the history, at least in relation to Nicholas, and potentially what are options or pathways out of the crisis we're in. Let me hand over to you, Nicholas, with that. Did you want me to go first? I could, oh, I, no, no, I you could go, why don't you go, Shadid? Okay, and then I will come to, to Nicholas. Please, please go ahead, so, so let me point out what the problems are, and then we look to Nicholas to, to, to fix them. So look, I have four points to make, but before I do that, thank you very much, Adam, for this invitation. And what I'm really pleased is that we are publicly talking about it. No problem ever got solved until people acknowledged that that was the case and tried to do anything about it. So I'll point out to you four things about the UK higher education system. First, I think it is a high-quality, high-touch, high-cost system of higher education. Second, I think that the system as it is now designed and funded is not fair to the, to the graduate themselves. And I'll say, what is the unfairness in the system? The third point I'll make is that what is really broken about the system and is broken, broken about the system is actually research funding. And we sometimes confuse it and lump it together with teaching funding. I'll point out why that is a bigger issue and is distorting some of the things in what you might call as teaching funding. But the last point I would make, and this comes from the vantage of having uh, been in universities in the US and Canada and, of course, the UK and Australia, that the system's broken everywhere, at least in the English-speaking world that I've talked about, and I'll tell you why that might be the case. So what do I mean about our high-quality system? Whether you measure it by virtue of the number of universities ranked in league tables or, more importantly, in graduation rates, which is a very sensitive measure of quality, the UK universities are amongst the top in the world. The other measure that you can look at is the staff-student ratio. How many academics to a student? UK universities have one of the lowest, which is a good thing. You want, you know, as high, you know, as, so as low a student ratio to a staff member, and UK universities have the lower ratio of students to a staff member uh, almost anywhere in the world. So very good outcomes, a very high-touch system, but not surprising that it is a high-cost system because it has a low staff-student ratio. And just to give you a number, these are publicly published numbers. An average UK university in its undergraduate courses runs at about 15 students to a staff member. If you look at these numbers in public universities in Canada and Australia, that number's 25. So you can see why it would have to be costly, because staff, of course, are the most precious, but also the most costly part of the system. The second is the issue of fairness. So for those of you who are in the UK, you would know this, but for those of you who are not in the UK... Um, the way the system works here is that a student applies to the university, the fees is the same, it's 9250 for every student for every course largely, and then they get a loan, a personal loan in a way, for that. Now that loan is backstopped by the government, so if you default on that loan no one comes for your house, but it costs the government about, let's say, 10%. The figures vary, some say zero, some say 20, I'll just say a very small amount. So effectively, the student lands are paying for 90% of the cost of the education. Now, in a simple world, if you thought, well, the student got all the gain, shouldn't they just pay for it? But that is not how it works out. Because if you look at the trajectory of students and you look at what they do to society around them, what you find generally is that, yes, from going to university you earn more, but then you pay back in taxes. But that's not the only effect you have in society. Generally, if you look in society, you have more university-going individuals. The entire society's productivity changes. So your neighbor who didn't even go to university benefits in some economic way from your going to university. So in some sense, we've got to calibrate it right. In the UK, the student picks up the entire burden. I think a fairer share would be the government to do a little bit more of the heavy lifting. But the point I want to make is that if you look at the internal accounts of universities, what you find is that this fee, totemic fees of £9,250 to teach an undergraduate student can strictly just about pay for the teaching element. 
But of course, what we really pride British education for is that it is research-led teaching. In fact, that's why people from all over the world come here, because we're not teaching schools. We are research-led. Now, who is paying for that cost? You cannot find that in 9,250. Now, if you go to the government, their answer would be that there is a separate stream of funding. It's called QR, name doesn't matter, which is supposed to cover for research time. But the problem is, at this point in time, it is not covering at all the cost of research that universities are doing. So the big deficit, if you may, is in the research element, which is inextricably linked with teaching, because that is what a British higher education experience is all about. Now, having been in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK, I think no one's got it right. Now, how could it be that these, you know, four great nations, they've all had great universities. If you look at the top 100 universities, these four countries actually hog a, How could it be that they got it wrong? And I think it is because we took a system um, which is so symbolically fixated on the Oxfords and the Cambridges and the Harvards of this world, which were developed at a time when less than 1% of the population used to go to university. And we have largely taken that system, its rituals, its structures, its processes, and in some sense used it for massification. And we need to seriously ask ourselves that if 50% of our population should go to the university, and in fact that's beginning to happen in many countries, is it really the same system that was designed for a percent, diluted and spread out? Is, or do we need some kind of radical innovation, some different way of providing post-18 education that can address this? So I would want us not to see this just as a financial issue, because the answer to that would be if we had more money, there'd be no problems. I would like us to really rethink whether universities need to be rethought for an era where we want 50%, maybe, of people all over the world to go to university. So I haven't provided many solutions, but I have, Nicholas, pointed out some challenges for our system. So now we look to you. <clears throat> Nicholas? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to argue that more public funding is an essential element in fixing the model. But in the present fiscal situation, uh, with competing and compelling claims from the NHS, etc., it means that the, the taxpayer resources for tertiary education are going to be very parsimonious in the short run. So let me step back a bit. When I was on leave from LSE working for the World Bank, um, working on the reforming post-communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe, I would say to countries who had this huge reform agenda, think of where you want to be in 10 years' time, and then work towards that in whatever way seems to work. Above all, don't do things that are going to create problems down the road. So with that by way of background, objectives, what are we trying to achieve? If you could cue slide two, please. Thank you. Um, three objectives. Size, tertiary education has to be sufficient to meet the growing demand for skills. Quality, which is not just the quality of the teaching, but the quality of the match between um, what institutions provide, what institutions would like, and national needs, including what firms want. And national needs include knowledge and skills also, and importantly, they include attitudes and values. So size, quality, the third objective is access, you can argue in social policy terms widening participation is desirable for its own sake. Um, the Treasury argument that I would make is that in a highly competitive world, the UK can't afford to waste talent. So three objectives, size, quality and access. Slide three, please. Um, what is, how do we achieve those objectives? Well, one slide on theory, one on policy. On theory... This strategy is supported both by economic theory and empirical um, evidence. The first element is, how do you pay for universities? Answer, mainly through a mix of taxpayer support and tuition fees. There's a classic argument for cost sharing 
There's loads of economic theory which we can come back to. This is not a personal opinion. It's rooted in solid economic theory. The second element is how do you finance students? And there, the main source uh, of student support should be well-designed income-contingent loans. That is to say loans where the borrower's repayments are a fraction of their earnings, not a fixed monthly repayment. And again, there's good theoretical reasons why that demand is more efficient and more equitable. Third element in the strategy, policies to promote access. Um, all the evidence points to the fact that the most powerful drivers of, uh, of participation in higher education are policies earlier in the system. I remember a former Secretary of State for Education losing his temper at a student debate. If I were a real socialist, he said, I wouldn't spend a penny on higher education. I'd spend it all on nursery education. And of course he was exaggerating, but there is an important point. So those are the three elements. If you could move to slide four, please. The policy is testing that strategy. And that's what the 2006 reforms in England did. And uh, full disclosure, I was uh, heavily involved in those. The reforms followed the strategy. Financing universities, element one, a combination of taxpayer support and variable tuition fees of up to £3,000. Second element, financing students, income contingent loans to cover fees and living costs with some grants um, uh, for, for students from poorer backgrounds. And then the third element, policies to widen participation, as I mentioned, restoration of some grants for students from poor backgrounds and a continuation of earlier policies uh, from previous earlier from earlier years, sure start to boost nursery education, the literacy and numeracy hour, education maintenance allowances and aim higher, which were aimed at persuading students to stay on in high school and complete their A-levels uh, and things like that. So this was a strategy, that, a policy that followed the strategy. And the next slide, please. You can say, OK, that's all fine and dandy. What actually happened? And what happened after the 2006 reforms was that tuition fee income rose by 87%. The number of grants and loans went up by 25%. The number of students went up by 20%, so we got expansion. And staggeringly, the number of applicants from the most disadvantaged backgrounds rose by 53%. And when the government statisticians did the numbers, they didn't believe it um, at first. You don't get social change as fast as that. Um, but they went back, they looked at the students' GCSE results, which tracked the improvement in school performance. So I would say this is a strategy that's based on theory, it's been implemented in practice, it worked well, that's the good news. The bad news is then along came the 2012 reforms. And don't get me started on those. Tripling student fees, increasing loans, raising the interest rate were motivated by exploiting a loophole in the way that student loans entered the public accounts, which was an accounting practice for which a leading supermarket was fined $235 million. Now, that problem has now been fixed, but the cat's been let out of the bag. It's, it's a classic example of look 10 years ahead and don't do anything that's going to make your life difficult in future. The 2012 reforms sadly did exactly that. So that's fine and dandy. Um, that's the problem. Getting out of the hole, what do we do? Well, I'm going to suggest three ways forward. More resources, adjusting the parameters of the loan system, and also, thirdly, taking a more holistic view of tertiary education. And if you could move to slide eight now, please. Um, I've listed ten potential sources where more resources could come from. Um, first of all, the taxpayer. Now, I've argued that's essential in the medium term, but it's not going to happen on the scale necessary in the short term. So you say, well, maybe tuition fees. But tuition fees... I would argue can't rise, that's a political argument, and shouldn't rise, that's a policy design argument. There's very little give there. You could say the student's future income through higher student loans. But again, 
loans are pretty much maxed out. Um, there is little, if any, scope there. So I would say those three things aren't going to do much in the short run. There are some areas where you might get a little bit of give. The students' current earnings through jobs they do while as students, but that's at, that competes with um, studying and social life. Um, so again, that's limited. There's the bank of mum and dad, or in our own case, the bank of grandma and grandpa. It's great, but it's limited and it's unequal across socioeconomic groups. The sixth potential is cross-subsidy from overseas student fees. But again, you've got limited scope for expansion. It exposes institutions to, to risk. There's been worries about the visa regime um, and a, a decline in the, and, 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 and sort of heavy reliance on students from a small number of countries, uh, which is taking a risk. Um, and in addition to that, um, cross-subsidies from overseas students is more of an option at elite universities. Um, and my final point is, if universities are paid four times as much for an overseas student as a British student, the incentive structure is pretty obvious. And it was so obvious that Ian Crawford and I made that point in a paper over 25 years ago. So again, overseas student fees, there's not much give there. Um, item seven, this is now slide, um, slide nine, please. Um, university commercial earnings but um, limited in scope, unequal across the sector. Gifts, philanthropy, again limited. Two possible options. One, in the short run, getting more contributions from employers. I looked it up in the budget statement, a 1% increase in the employer national insurance contribution for all employees yields £8.6 billion a year. So there are potential resources there. Um, and the tenth item on the list, which again is something that could be done in the short run, is to sell off some student debt. So those are ten things, and of those it's only employer contributions and student debt that I think offer a chance of significant additional resources in the short run. Over the medium term, um, slide ten please, um, we bring in, we restore some teaching grant, complete agreement that that has to happen. There's then adjusting the parameters on student loans, and I won't go into details on those, but the problem we have at the moment is we have high fees, it's a scary sticker price, but nobody, virtually nobody pays that in full because loans are very leaky, but the subsidies on loans are invisible. So we've got a scary sticker price and leaky loans, and clearly a better strategy would be a less scary sticker price and less leaky loans, and adjusting the parameters of student loans uh, would be the way to do that. And, and my final slide, slide 11, please, um, wider reform, and this is more in the medium term. Um, tertiary education faces an increasingly complex task of matching the preferences and needs of students, education providers and taxpayers. So you need a flexible system in which people can build skills in different ways, in different combinations, at different speeds. Um, so I have this metaphor of somebody who takes out a loan to get a plumbing qualification, and if they then want to convert that into a degree, they can do so by adding units on accounting or management, or for that matter, history or philosophy. So you've got a granular system, um, one essentially of credit transfer. And I think if you do that and support it with granular finance and have greater emphasis on po policies earlier in the system, then you've got a way forward for the system as a whole. My final point, the strategy I talked about I haven't gone into specifics. It's a general strategy. It will clearly need to adjust over time, but the strategy as a whole, I would suggest, is robust. So let me leave it there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Both of that is really, really interesting. And it seems to me that there's three important themes that are coming out of this. The first, uh, and the most obvious, is 
we don't have the appropriate balance between subsidy and fees. Mm. There's in Shittage's, um notion, 90% of the cost of higher education are borne by the student, uh, and yet there is a societal benefit which effectively the individual is underwriting. Mm. And that's something that needs to, we need some rethinking on, and I want to come back to that in a minute. The second is both of you have raised is the system of education appropriate for the economic and social needs of the 21st century? And that's the second conversation that I want to pose. And then the third, which is close to my heart, is the cost of international fees and the appropriate moral and other challenges that come with that structure. I'll come to all of that in a minute, but I want to start off somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that is, Shiti, you made the point that free education is not, uh, that the crisis of higher education mm -hmm. and the financing of higher education is transnational in at least the Anglo-Saxon parts of the world, Canada, uh, the United States, the UK, Australia. It is just because I don't know what's happening in Spain or Italy or Germany in any depth. They may also be in a crisis, but I just know the English crisis. That, and that I wanted to come back to, but it was also in some senses under, underscored by Nicholas's argument about what is the appropriate way to fund mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, higher education systems. And as I understood what Nicholas was saying, is in some senses the 2000 and six uh, reforms were effectively to enable access because that kinds of skill sets were required and it had two fundamental principles that you need uh, to have both fees and subsidy. It didn't say free, uh, free education. And so it, in some senses he bears that, he, he bears your conclusion. I want to start with the question, there are universities, there are countries that do fund their higher education system. Uh, Germany does, at least the tuition costs. France does. Yes. And I remember being um, in a conversation at, over dinner with the, a former chancellor of the Exchequer, and I said to him, whether you like France or not, or whether you like Germany or not, they have provided the training ground for a set of professionals that provide the skill sets required for a performing economy. France, as eco economy, uh, does achieve growth. It does uh, provide services. So does Germany. In many ways, Germany is a far more successful economy than the United Kingdom has. And yet, it has a, a free higher education system. Why is it that free education is not possible in countries which are the third or the fifth or the sixth richest countries in the world. Germany does it. France does it. Why can't the UK do it? So I think it'd be, it'd be important to point out two things. Education is not, education, university education is not free anywhere. It costs everywhere. It's a question of who pays. Place. And of course the Germans pay for their higher education, they just pay for their higher education through their general taxes, just as we in this country choose to pay for health through our general taxes, whereas in Germany they have a much bigger private insurance system for health. So these are social choices, and I will leave to Nicholas uh, a, you know, an examination a, a, across Europe as to how you know, we, because of historical other reasons, have made different choices, because that is the opposite. In Germany, there's much more private health insurance than there is in this country. So it costs everywhere. But here is, I think, the issue that we as universities need to ask ourselves. The British system gives you a higher unit of resource than the German system per student. So the question the British university should be asking, not whether you want a free system, so to say, do you want to swap your lot with the Germans? And have, you don't have to go as far as Germany. In the United Kingdom, the unit of resource in England where we have a fee system 
versus Scotland, which doesn't have the fee, but so has this, so to say, free education, as I said, is 20% higher now in England. We're even crying with our high system at 20% higher. So in many ways, you could argue that from a university's perspective, and I pointed out the problem of fairness to the student, this is actually a good system. This is a system that has allowed perhaps why, if you look in the league table of 100, even though France and Germany are equally well-developed economies, they have hardly the same number of universities in leading university. Areas. So I think this system has worked well for the university system, I would say. Um, and, and I'll hand it over to Nicholas as to why the Europeans have made different choices. <clears throat> well, first of all, countries like France and Germany, as you said, there's no tuition charge, but there's no maintenance support either. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there is a question about quality. I mean, certainly in France... You know, they admit a huge number of students in the first year and then an awful lot drop out. And a separate quality issue, and this is a point I made um, to colleagues in Sweden, is Germany and Sweden have world-class industries. Mm. They don't really have world-class universities. I mean, if you look at the top 100, they don't really figure there. So there is a quality issue. And there is a third point, which is slightly nerdy but worrying. There's something called the Bomol cost disease, mm. Um, named after the famous economist Will Bomol, and he made the point that the cost of services rises over time more rapidly than the cost of manufactured goods. Productivity in manufacturing rises faster than productivity in services. That drags up wages throughout the economy. That means services become relatively more expensive. Labour-intensive services like the National Health Service or, you know, as you've said, sort of 15 to 1 staff-student ratio, it's be quality becomes more and more expensive and therefore how sustainable that the model in France and Germany is without eroding quality further, you know, would worry me if I were a German policymaker. And can, can I just add one thing on quality? Because I do want to stand up for the quality of our system. The, um, and, and you could say, well, ranking tables are, you know, sort of manufactured, so who's interested in that? I'm interested in the student. On average, 80% of British students or students in British universities who start an undergraduate course graduate. That number is somewhere between 50 to 60% in the French and German universities, precisely because they're structured differently. I'm not saying that's a wrong choice. I'm saying it's a system design choice that we are making. So I think that that's an important point, and I think it's a very uh, important variable to indicate world-class quality. I do get worried about universities in the UK and US carry on talking about how world-class their universities are when essentially it is ultimately what gets counted and how you count it. So ultimately, if you look at the output, basically German universities train a set of professionals without which world-class German industry would not exist. Yeah. They actually produce the outcome of skills that is required for that society to effectively perform on the global economic and social stakes. And in some senses, they do a better job because those, are, those societies mm -hmm. do so. Now, if you measuring world class on the basis of the publications or you're doing uh, uh, the number of international staff, all of those things then there is no doubt we come out. Sure. But if you ask questions like, does that, do we produce the professionals required to sustain world-class industry? Germany does that fantastically. If you want to know, uh, do, do European countries like Finland provide a better movement across technical universities, universities, and provide a better layer of skills in the broader society, they seem to do much better. And I just put that as something for consideration by both of you as we move on to the debate in substance. But this is my last point about sort of breaking down the silo between further education and higher education, mm -hmm. uh, which would be part of that adjustment to rebalance and make much more flexible the offer as between vocational training 
and intellectual training. And it's a vast spectrum. And at the moment, our system is distorted towards the analytical and hence the point of rebalancing, which I think would improve things in the way that you say is the case in Germany. And, and a thought from you? Yes. So Germany, Korea, Netherlands, if you look at which, if we had a league table, which instead of measuring what it does is papers published, cited by other mm. academics, which the English universities do very well in, and that's partly because we speak English. Like, a lot of the world speaks English, so you get an obvious advantage. But if you turned it around and said, no, I'm not interested in that, tell me how many publications are cross-referenced to the industry. The universities that come on top are Germany, Dutch, and Korea. Korea is... A, a, there are a few Korean universities in the world top 100, maybe say all national, but when it comes to publishing with industry and Samsung being a bit collaborator for... So... I think the point here, to go back, is that there isn't going to be one model of universities, even though the league table yeah. is trying to suggest there is. And this is very important because some of our listeners are from, you know, the global south. I think be very careful in adopting the Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard model yes. and extending it in a diluted form to your societies for your stage of development. Now, coming back to the UK, we are not a manufacturing economy. Maybe we'll become a green manufacturing economy. That would be very nice. We are a heavily service-led economy. So the question we should be asking is not how can we be more like the Germans where we don't have the Mercedes and the BMW. The question we should be asking is what would be our unique contribution in the world economy? And are we as universities preparing the students for our industry? And I will say that's the service industry. And to the degree it's an industry at all, it's the life sciences industry. It may become the green time will tell. So, so I think there isn't a single answer of a university. League tables are misleading because they suggest it's some kind of a race and if you're ahead, you're ahead. You're absolutely right in saying that the German and the Dutch and the Korean system is probably very well suited for their economies as they used to be. Mind you, Germany's not performing that well yeah. for the last two years. So I think that's, that's the way to look at it. Let's I, I, I think yeah. here the issue is that Insti different aspects are done in different institutions and it should be more flexible. I mean, at my institution, the London School of Economics, it's, in, it's analytical training. Five miles down the road, Kingston University, certainly used to, I think still does, have a foundation degree in aircraft engine maintenance mm -hmm. and they cannot generate the graduates fast enough. They graduate on Friday, Monday they're working for an international airline. Now... You need both. Hmm? So let me ask you, let's shift the debate, because in a sense, at one level, you know, we had 100 years ago, though our universities served less than 1% of the population, and we effectively took the nation's resources and paid for that. Now, we any, depending on which society, you between 50 and 55%, in the global north, and effectively, you're still having a huge financial crisis. So we've now got to think about a balance between fees and subsidy. We know that in the UK, the balance has been skewed in favor of individual student fees, and one of the challenges is not, you can say that it's a leaky loan system, but the emotional wrought that students feel by having a debt hanging over exactly. them from the age of 23 exactly. is not fair on young people. How do we think through moving and shifting uh, towards a greater subsidy? Everybody, somebody pays for this. Your argument, Nicholas, in the short term, is that we need more from employers we need to think through a tax associated with employers. And as you do that, you buy some time so that you can start thinking through a more broader tax contribution. Is that something that you would see as the immediate play if you were advising the new government coming into power? What I would like to see a new government do is find some resources from somewhere to stave off a crisis and simultaneously to set up some sort of body to map out and then test a 10-year strategy 
involving all the stakeholders and people, and, and then we implement it in a sensible way. I mean, I realise that British politics doesn't lend itself to strategic thinking, which is one reason why we're in the fix we are. But, I, I mean, yes, more money now and a 10-year plan that is, is widely bought into. And have you a thought? So I had this, again, this conversation with the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he, he said the following. In British society and in British government, two areas will trump education every single time, health and defence. So in that context, is there likelihood for quick money, and where would that quick money come from? Is it the employers or somewhere else? The only two I can see in the very short run are employers and possibly selling student debt. Over the medium term, there has to be taxpayer finance alongside tuition fees. Clearly, if you, if you try to rely on the taxpayer too much, then you get the problems they have in Scotland, that um, higher education is trumped by other sectors. So you need a balance between the two, and there is much that can be said about what that balance might be. But I think the subsidy needs to be large enough to do two things. One, to make sure that universities do have a sufficient unit of resource. Secondly, to make sure that the maximum student loan is one that a graduate with a good earning, quote-unquote good earnings, can repay in full in present value terms. Shitich, your thoughts? Well, um, you see, it's easy for us to hear say that the employers pay um, because they're not at this table. I... I do not know who the next Chancellor of the Exchequer is going to be, but I think whosoever it, that is will be convincing employers as to how we're making Britain a better place to do business. It'd be very hard to tell them that the way we are doing that is by putting yet another percent of tax on them. What the employers are, are going to say, and I've had some discussion with some representatives of employers' associations, what they would say is, look, there already is a corporate tax system. You know, why do you need another hypothecated tax, which is depending upon the graduates I employ, because they would argue that, well, that would just mean I'll employ less graduates. Uh, now, what could also lead over time is that that was that the graduate salaries could adjust ever so slightly downwards, because all we're talking really about is a percent of the entire salary system. So it's not that the system can't absorb it. It is who will make that political argument? Um, and I find that just as potentially a Labour government might find it hard to sell students, because they were promising just about a few years ago the zero fees, to now say that we come into government we increase your fees, that would be a hard thing to sell. Similarly, when you're trying to assure business that we will have business-friendly policies. So, look, I, I can't... I, we're boxed in. I mean, the, the question, let me ask a question, because it does seem to me that there are societies which have higher taxes and do, are much more economically productive, even on corporate tax. There are. And, and the question is, it seems to me, in, com, corporates tend to price stability far more than a slightly higher tax. And the UK has had more problem with instability in the last True. couple of years True. than it has on tax. A couple of points. First of all, as I was told, and I haven't had time to check this, that £2.3 billion of the employer apprentice levy yeah. hasn't been spent. Yeah. So that's an easy win. Secondly, the sector needs to engage with employers to say, what can we offer them yes. in ways that give them what they want without compromising what universities do? And again, one needs money now, but the offer to employers is part of something that needs to be worked out as part of the strategy. In terms of taxes, I think I'm right in saying that countries like Canada and France, and there's at least one other country, have higher taxes than we do, have faster growth rates, and have less inequality. So there is nothing... I mean, the idea that cutting taxes leads to growth in and of itself, there was an experiment on that called the trust budget. It didn't work, it won't work. It's just illiterate economics. Okay, so let me shift this debate to, it seems to be a third and important point. I've been fascinated by the debate 
between government and vice chancellors over the last two weeks, three weeks around international views. You are one of them. You yes, and, the vice and, and yeah, you know, I see myself yeah. as part of the yeah. vice chancellor yeah. uh, cohort, and I think that we collectively are responsible for whatever the strengths and weaknesses of the system are. But what fascinated me about the debate was, on the one hand, government figures cent- figures centering around the debate around immigration. And everything about international fees was about immigration and how do we prevent people from coming here. And what the response of uh, vice chancellors broadly has been is don't interfere with international students. They actually contribute to our institutions in powerful ways. They contribute to our society in powerful ways. They important, if you actually get rid of them or interfere with the, the visa regime and the post-study, uh, post-study visa regime, we will create a financial crisis both for our universities and broadly for the society as well. I broadly agree with that. I, I want to say I would have hated an outcome if suddenly government started interfering with the post-study visa regime. But I think that what is missing in those questions, in those engagements by vice chancellors, myself included, is asking the question, a, a couple of important questions. Is the operational model of the universities today what it should be? Are we doing the best? You ask the question, it's a high cost, high touch, high quality model. It's partly high cost because lower staff student ratios, 15. Would we irreparably be damaged if we were 20? It's a question we need to at least ask if we don't answer. And we're refusing to ask that. It's give us more money, but it's not saying how would we do differently. Let me pose a number of questions as a vice chancellor in the UK, but that one that comes from the global south. Is it morally tenable that we charge a student from Malawi 45,000 pounds for a one year study and use that resource to cross subsidize domestic students because we're not paying an appropriate subsidy or fund the research time of academics. Should we not be asking about those moral questions? But it is also from a sensible business strategy really dangerous because 70% of your students come from four countries, China, India, Nigeria, and one other. And one of the things is your government flags off the Chinese state regularly every day when you make your entire higher education system predicated on that. The question I'm asking is as much as there needs to be more subsidy, do we as vice chancellors not need to take some ownership and say, how are we going to rethink the business model? How can we recreate a model that delivers more for other stakeholders? And what stake do we have in reorganizing the higher education system? We're doing too little of that, and I take as much responsibility as any other vice chancellor. And should we not be asking the question, it's time that we started doing more thinking rather than more complaining as vice chancellor? And I pose that to both you, Nicholas, as somebody in the system, Because I must say that as much as I blame vice chancellors, I have to ask our union colleagues whether they do enough thinking about this. Because all they do is complain. But when they talk about marking and assessment boycotts, one of the things my grumble with my unions was, who do you think will pay for the extra money? It will be international students. And what is the moral social justice imperative? So shouldn't we as vice chancellors talk about it? But shouldn't be unions... And the academics who sit in the unions start to start thinking what the university should be and not just demand the university of the old. Nicholas and then you, Shetich. Well, first of all, international students are utterly wonderful. It's been part of LSE's tradition since the interwar years. But building a system whose financial viability depends on an increasing number of overseas students is clearly barking mad and totally undesirable. 
one ought to have a system whereby the balance between UK and overseas students is a policy variable, not a key financial driver. Mm. Um, I think um, over-reliance on overseas students, I mean, I think it's bad for the balance of higher education. Um, there's, I totally agree. There's a, a real mor mor morality concern and a business stra strategy problem. I think with universities, I mean, it comes back to the third of my suggested reforms, thinking more holistically about tertiary education, that there is room to do things in different ways at different institutions, but also we are still trapped by part of our history. Historically, universities were essentially monasteries where clever young men, and I mean men, went to sit and have conversations with the scholars, and it was sort of just part of the intellectual life of the nation. It didn't matter for economic performance. And we've moved away from that, but only partially. We haven't yet broken free. And I think the importance of breaking down the silos between HE, higher education, and further education is precisely it will make it easier to have different modes of teaching, including larger class sizes for some subjects, different balances between in-person and online. Um, I, you know, I agree. I totally share your essay question. Mm. Shitich? So, so, look, you raise two questions, which is the moral justification of a big differential in fees. And secondly, what will we do as university systems, you know, which is students, staff, you know, leaders like vice chancellors, to make the system more affordable. Uh, so first, to the moral justification. Is it morally justified to charge an international student higher fees than you charge domestic students? And I would say yes, and I'll let me explain to you why I think that is the case. Um, universities are not made overnight. A university is created, its reputation is created, of the long investment, often of long periods of time, into infrastructure that, that a particular community has made through its tax-paying system. So it is not unfair, then, that someone who is only coming for, for that is charged somewhat more. Now, is that four times more? <laughs> that could be debatable. The economists could calculate what that ratio is. I wouldn't be surprised if that number isn't four it might settle at some lower estimate. How is the rest being justified? I would suggest it's being justified on marketable reputation. Because when you say four, it's not that every British university is charging four times more. You, are, you can actually draw a very beautiful graph that that ratio across British universities is anywhere from 1.5 to four, and the ones who are charging more are charging because they're much higher in the league table. So I think there is a defensible, pragmatic reason why international students should pay more. And then there is, I dare say, just a market reason why international students choose to pay more. And I could tell you that in countries like the US, where there is a breadth of private education, they're doing it within the country. So you don't get the Harvard degree for the same price that you might get a Michigan, and you won't get a Michigan one for the same price that you might get another university. So, so I think we have to just be honest in acknowledging that some of it is justifiable, some of it. But then you raise the bigger question, and, and this is the question that worries me, that in our own country, we are very sensitive about widening access. And actually, we in Britain can be legitimately proud in the way that our universities have actually embraced across all sorts of diversity, economic diversity, uh, ethnic diversity, and, and I think uh, I am absolutely proud of the fact that actually this is one of the few countries in the world where minority communities are overrepresented in universities. Show me many others where that is the case. So I think we should be proud of it. But that's just on our shores. What is our obligation to widening access when we benefit so significantly from the contribution of international students, their parents, their families, their communities? And I think we haven't turned our attention enough to that. And what could it look like? The simplest form is just a bit more scholarships. But that then just becomes financial, and the ratio of it w w cannot be heavily changed. You'll just have to increase the fees more. So that's not... So it is certainly a part of it, but it's not the answer. 
I think the kind of answer that we could be looking for is, is what I see often in the pharmaceutical industry, not always, but sometimes, that when they sell their products in the West, they brand them in a certain way and they get branded price. But often in some certain diseases, very carefully that they're not cannibalizing this market or the other, they actually sell you the same product as a unbranded, white label, generic product, but at a special price, uh, which does not recover cost of research, does not recover. So I think we could find a way that the same education that you offer in SOAS and we offer at King's, we can't have the King's faculty do it because the model doesn't work, but we could share elements of that which would not cannibalize in any way the students who are coming, which would be a different experience, but would definitely raise the quality in Global South and other parts of the world. And I think we should be held to that. And I dare say that our international students should say, well, you charge me what I am, I pay for it. But the widening access partnership then is that you are contributing to the uplift of education of the countries from where these students broadly come from. So to me, that's the quid pro quo. Can I follow that up? Because I have a question, and, and I really want us to go to the solution that you had suggested. The thing that intrigues me is you could say that part of the reason people come here hmm? is for market reputation. I would say that part. most part, part, I would say a significant part of that has to do with the nature of inequality in the global economy and a desire for people to access the American or the British market, which a British degree gives access to. I don't believe that the vast majority of PGT students come because of our research reputation. I believe they come for because they can get a good set of professional skills that will open up access to the market. So I put that on the table because our second point is Mo Britain's great higher education system, in part, is a fantastic contribution from its people. But it's also that it was an empire and it sucked resources from the rest of the empire to build the system. Oxford's great buildings, many which came from gold mines from South Africa, and you can see that replicated around the world. Does that not give us an obligation to go the route you suggested? Can we do more? We've got hundreds of millions of people not trained in parts of the global south. They have to be trained if we're going to challenge, address climate change or pandemics or renewable energy. And those universities, however well resourced they are, are not big enough to train those hundreds of millions of people. That means we, with some surplus capacity, some incredible capabilities, could partner better with those institutions to reach out to that hundreds of millions of people, which ultimately we will benefit from. But that does mean it can't be high cost. It has to be structured in a manner that is operationally feasible. And I wanted to put that to both of you as a thought. So do we not have an obligation? We, we definitely do. We have a historical obligation for reasons that you said, but we have a current obligation, one could argue, because it would be true that most of the international students coming to us are the very privileged in their country. So whereas in our country we are always concerned about widening access, you might argue, why are we not concerned equally in, in, in that? Now, to be very fair, the universities of this country didn't willingly go to widening access. They did because there was a policy structure, an incentive structure, and then finally a penalty structure yes. that, let's just say, held our hand in that direction. The difficulty with our international obligations is that there is neither a policy structure nor, frankly, any enforceable structure, uh, nor a penalty structure. So you would almost have to build a kind of sort of Paris Accord or whatever else that could work, <coughs> or a London Accord, that all universities that benefit from international students, you know, mainly from the Global South through differential fees, because it is true, you can go to European universities and there isn't differential fees, so the argument there is different. You could argue that we need to sign up to some kind of a London Accord where we're held to 
So what are you going to mitigate the, the, the inequality aspect of this internationally? And the answers could come in many ways as they come in the Paris Accord. You can do different things. But they would largely have to finally lead to building of capacity at lesser cost in the countries where this talent is originating from. And frankly, from our point of view, talent and wealth. These are bright students with money who come and pay us the extra fees. So, Nicholas? One of the silver linings of COVID when we all had to go online for a year was yeah. I recorded my lectures on Zoom. Now that we're wonderfully back in person, I continue to pre-record my lectures. The students listen to them. I gather at one and a quarter or one and a half speed before the lecture hour. And then the lecture hour is live in-person Q&A. Now, lecture recordings can be played to millions of people. So we've got the technology. The lectures could come from the UK. Possibly there could be an offer of some online live Q&A with the Kings or SOAS or LSE people. But most of the, local, the, the sort of in-person teaching would be done locally. Mm. And that seems to me with today's technology to be an eminently feasible sure. model technically and I think one that could be made to work. I mean, there'd be a question of making sure that the, the local class teaching was of a suitable quality, quality, but that's also helping to build up capacity. So let me move to some questions from the audience. There's a number of colleagues from around the world. Um, the first one suggests is the problem is that too many people are going to university. <laughs> Uh, other avenues, whether that is apprenticeships or other forms of further education, are not seen in equal measure to pursuing higher education. Have we become too snobbish around education? Mm -hmm. And does higher education have some part to play in changing that perception? Let me start with you, Nicholas. I mean, the answer is yes, we've become too snobbish. Precisely back to widening, the ref widening tertiary education to think of it holistically as a whole. There are people going to university because there is a natural escalator from high school graduation to a bachelor's degree. There are much less well-defined pathways for a non-degree tertiary education. That needs to be fixed. Um, and then you would find a lot of people not necessarily going to university but starting on something more vocational and then, if they want to, building up to make a degree on that later. So uh, I, I totally agree with what the question is saying. No, I, <laughs> I, can, I can agree. And, and look, we are obviously complicit in it because we are the providers of that. But if the question is, is there, an, is there a certain optimal number of people who ought to go to university? My answer is not. I, I think it would be foolish to determine that 37% is the right number because the point is there isn't one university, and I think that's your point. To me, if the, to me, the more right question is, is there guided human development of great value possible after the age of 18? Yeah. I would say for everyone, the yeah. answer is yes. And you know what? It doesn't stop at 21 either. Yeah. So I think we, we really need to rethink this. And I'm a psychiatrist and a cognitive neuroscientist, and I've looked at brain development and things like that. How did we land on 18? You know, so almost every advanced society now is providing you, you know, state-based education till 12th grade. Who decided 18? Why isn't 16 the right number? Why isn't 20 the right number? Um, so I think there should be provision for universal post-18 support from the state to educate you. But it should be flexible and tailored to need rather than a totemic degree with a graduation and those things in the air, because I think that's the social desirability. You know, your hat in the air. So what you're arguing for, as I understand it, is the, the presence of options yes. post-18, which are publicly funded in some yes. way, yes. that allow people to go to what those options are, yep. And I'm imagining from what Nicholas earlier on said, there would be some benefit that those options are not rigid pathways, but yeah. allow for some movement exactly. between them. Exactly. So if you spend the first 10 years in one part of the system and decide you want to change yeah. and go to another part for another career, 
then that option is open to you as part of that. And, and, and that's the theory of the lifelong learning entitlement uh, idea in the UK. It's just now how do you implement it yeah. without breaking the budget? Because if because at the moment only about fifty percent of the people take take that loan. If now you said that loan was available to hundred percent of the population to do whatever they liked for four years, that would double the cost, and we don't know if we can financially recover it out of salaries. So, um, but I think conceptually we are there. Um, the difficult thing for the universities will be if the government said we have a fixed pot of money and we don't want to privilege universities. Because at the moment, we're in a privileged position. If you want to do the standard three-year degree, you can easily get the student loan. If you want to do something else for a year or two, it's actually not accredited, regulated. You can't get the loan. So here's another question that's also coming from someone in the audience. And the question goes, universities are on the blip uh, of, a, of a really challenging financial situation. The OFS report has warned that institutions need to rethink or reevaluate their forecasts, especially given the declining student numbers. Hasn't this proven that over 10 years of trying to operate as private businesses doesn't work for the sector? Remove, removing the student caps in 2013 and then having to pour money into complex marketing campaigns and new business enterprises has failed. Now, I'm assuming from that question or that remark that what the question, the question is posing is, is it better to go back to the pre-2012 system? Is that where the answer lies? And should that be something that we should be thinking about? Or is the horse is bolted and we need to look at alternative solutions? You see, I, I sometimes feel that, um, there is too much fear-mongering about universities going bankrupt because that assumes that universities have no ability to be flexible. That assumes that universities have no ability to innovate. So I, I think that, you know, I, I want them to be properly funded, but you could well find that this might be the moment when universities start differentiating, they start thinking mm -hmm. in a different way. So I don't think we should buy into this we must absolutely ensure that there is fair and appropriate funding. We must have models where people are not on needless, precarious contracts. But we should not be afraid of the fact that universities will need to be different from the way they are today. Maybe that SS student-staff ratio will have to change. And maybe we'll find better ways that where with the aid of technology and different way of working, a staff-to-student ratio of 20 to 1 which is a third improvement of productivity in one way of thinking, could still provide a very good product. So uh, I think, I, no, I wouldn't give up on many things that are working right, but I think we'll be open to change. Nicholas? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this, I mean, universities aren't businesses in the sense of yes. entities that make profits to distribute to shareholders. Yes. Um, that we need to be run professionally and in a business-like way, yes that we operate in, to some extent, in a competitive environment. But to illustrate the difference, if universities were really competitive, the three of us wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here giving you LSE trade secrets away. Yes. You know, yes. uh, We collaborate and cooperate yes. because that's part of who we are, but we also compete. So it, it, it can't be the simple business model, and uh, I think it was a mistake to do so. But the problem is that vice-chancellors who have institutions to run have to respond to whatever the prevailing incentives are. And if the government gives dumb incentives, Thanks. it leads to bad outcomes. Yeah. How will universities survive in their current form? The question moves on to ask, what's the likelihood of mergers? It's happened in other systems quite dramatically. Uh, I know that in my country it did, in Australia it did, for a fair degree, but I think even in the UK. Yes. Uh, What's the likelihood of mergers being back on the table? Huh. So the issue is, what are they forced by? Are they forced by policy? Is they forced by some understanding of regional good? Or are they forced by a bankruptcy? If it's the last, that would be really difficult because it would be very chaotic. It would, 
if it's a part of some national strategy of regionalization, because look, you can't merge a university in any meaningful way, a university in the southeast of England with something in Scotland. I mean, that wouldn't really make sense. What could make sense is some sort of a more regional rationalization. Now, up to now, the government's never attempted a top-down strategy. That's not the British way. The system is supposed to take care of it. My problem is that if we are waiting for financial bankruptcies to lead to that, that may not work in our system because universities are not profitable entities to run. So you see what happens in the real business world is someone who knows how to make it cheaper takes you on, strips out your cost, and imposes their model. Our models are all very similar. They are all in some ways unsustainable. So I don't think that the bankruptcy model leading to mergers, leading to a better system will work. So what it will require is thoughtful government or some policy guidance on how this happens. Nicholas? I mean, it's back to the more flexible system. Yeah. Why do institutions necessarily have to merge? It could be courses could be shared yeah. between institutions. Yeah. I mean, time was when all our colleges were colleges of the University of That's London right. and there were university level degrees. Um, now, I'm not talking about necessarily degrees that way, but individual courses could, could, could be run jointly by more than one institution. And that could be quite beneficial. Now, here is the, you know, we are within a mile of each other. Students could easily walk. I think the light should be shown on us. We hardly share any courses. You're probably teaching international relations. I'm teaching international. And, and now, look, we're very proud of our international relations differentially because I'm sure you would have reasons as mine to think that I'm proprietary and better. But, but you could imagine where someone could look at this and say, no, look, there has to be a better way of doing it. So let me ask you this. And there's somebody who also has posed this question. And that is, the person suggests that university missions are overstretched. Mm. And should we not get back to basics? And the way this is defined here is to provide a place of study for students to learn and grow. That should be the focus of universities. And that's what should be there. Now, what it excludes is an understanding of research and knowledge production. But I just wanted to get your thoughts for that question. So you, you see, what is considered basic changes? Um, OK, I agree with that. But now tell me, mental health support for students. Is that kind of basic or not? Support for students coming from diverse backgrounds, is it basic or not? Now look, 50 years ago, it wasn't in our consideration of basic. Now providing all those additional supports is as natural and basic as things. So I think we would find it hard to strip out what society has gradually come to expect of its institutions um, and saying we don't do that. Uh, is there other waste in an institution that, of course, any institution has that? Could universities look at doing things differently? We certainly could. One thing we have to acknowledge if you look at the ratio of professional services staff to academic staff in universities, it used to be somewhere in the range of 0.7, like more academics. Today in British universities, we're running at 1.1. Now, the professional services colleagues are doing very important things. But do all of those things need to be done in the same way as they're being done? I think it's, it's up for consideration. Nicholas? Purposes of universities the transmission of knowledge and skills and attitudes and values, as always. The development of new knowledge, as always. The new one is being part of the growth economy, that with skill bias, technical change and all that, the idea that universities could just teach and do research as sort of the cultural life of the nation, um, that world has, the world has changed. Mm. So we need to engage with government and business as part of what we do, but without compromising the other two. One final question, and I do then have to close. But I was struck by, and I largely agree with this, and I'm sure Shitij does, that when you said one of the challenges of vice chancellors is the incentive structure is written in a way that they look at certain things and don't look at others. And at one level, that's true. So one of the things, having been a vice chancellor for three and a half years here and eight years in South Africa, one of the things that 
the incentive structure forces you to do and what my board of trustees make sure I do is we run the institution in a financially sustainable way. If we run it at huge deficits, they, we are not able to do that. But that comes at the cost of other things that we've spoken about. A focus on how do we create a global academy of commons that provides the professional professionals to address the transnational challenges of our time. How do we advance our social justice needs that partners with institution? How do we achieve and enable inclusion in particular ways? But is this simply a question of incentives? Or do vice chancellors and frankly academics need some agency in this? Are they simply servants to policy incentives? Or should they start be thinking of becoming agents in their own reimagination of how to manage universities, how to build them, and how to structure them in a way that meets the challenges of the time? A drowning person will grab at anything that's going. If the financial situation is really tight, vice chancellors who have to keep their institutions going have little choice but to follow the incentives. That is highly undesirable. It would be much better not to be a drowning person and to um, then have the freedom to pursue the sorts of ideas which, you know, I think we all agree ought to be pursued. But, I mean, if, it's, if one's in crisis mode the whole time, it, 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 it forecloses the options. Let me come in back because I'm, I'm sure she is going to want to reply to this. So I can understand that now. But for 15 years we were not in drowning. And it seemed to me that British education had it really good and they milked it for all of its worth and didn't start asking the hard questions when they could have had when the going was good in 2013 and 14 and 15 and 16. And now we're scrambling in a crisis moment. Isn't that a failure on our collective part as academics, as university, as vice chancellors, myself included? about we let while the, and this is what worries me about a lot of the interventions in recent weeks is in all of the debate there is not an acknowledgement that we need to do things differently mm -hmm. that we need to start thinking differently that this is not only about the failure of others it is also about where did we fail and when do we become serious agents in our own rehabilitation of the university system. So, so, Adam, whether we acknowledge it or not, the world thinks that of us. So if you go out into the real world and ask who is to blame for you know, where the universities are, they won't turn around and say, well, it's just the education minister got the incentives wrong. They will look to us. And, and look, I, I don't think we need to be overly harsh. In the end, the universities and vice chancellors are all you know, made of human agents. And we were responding to what we thought we could do best. British universities were focused on becoming world-class in research, increasing their research. And if you look over time, we managed to do it, even though there wasn't government funding for it. So in some sense, if you're asking, you know, where has the infusion of the last 10 years of international students led to? It has led to the fact that despite zero extra money from government, British universities have stayed at the forefront of research. Now what you're saying is, all right, that window is closing. A new game will have to be found. And I think we'll respond to that. So I'm actually more hopeful than, than the fear-mongering in some sense that the British higher education system is in a doom loop and is going to go down. I am very confident, and if there are parents listening, I can assure you uh, your children will remain welcome in the UK. They will receive a world-class education that I think will be as competitive as it is. And I think I genuinely believe we're in a slight low point. I think we will recover from this. Yeah. We will need to have a 10-year vision. We'll need a new idea. And this is the time for it. It'll happen in the next 12 or 24 months. I don't know when it is being recorded and displayed, but today an election has been called in this country. On the 4th of July, we'll have a new government. This is a pivotal time. For 14 years, we've had a certain kind of thinking. So I think the real challenge for the vice chancellor is is can we, uh, you know, engage the next 12 months with more than just seeking financial sustainability? Yeah. So because you raised three points. So 
The first is necessary but not sufficient. So can we engage in the next 12 months? So that should be the test. And we should be able to sit here in 12 months and be able to answer how we were more than just about money in the reimagining of the next 10 years of the system. So I think that's our challenge. So here's where I want to end, and I want to get your thoughts on this, because it seems to me I don't want to summarize where we're coming to. Firstly, there is no doubt that for all of the challenges of British higher education, it's a great system. Yeah. And it's got an incredible set of institutions. And within it, it's got an incredible set of scholars, many of whom, if not most of whom, have their heart in the right place yeah. and have Absolutely. skill sets that could be of value to both the na nation, but I would argue to the global community in quite positive. However, if we're going to do that, we have to reimagine higher education for the time that we are. We have to reimagine it in a manner that is not simply focused on making sure we are financially sustainable, as important that is, and we have to be, but we have to imagine it in a way that also says, how do we enable inclusion? How do we enable economic competitiveness? How do we build the skill set that British society requires? But also, how do we do this in a way where we recognize we are a nation in a broader human community? And that human community confronts a range of transnational challenges. And we as a human community have to recognize that if we don't cohere and come together to develop the capacities and human capabilities and knowledge for all of us to succeed, none of us will succeed. And that requires a reimagination of the higher education project as much mm -hmm. as it requires politicians and funding to change. And in that context, two important principles come to the right. One is we have to have a better balance between subsidy and fees. Mm -hmm. That we need to understand that the tax system, whether it goes through a particular tax like the employer's tax or the general tax mm -hmm. system or a combination of both has to be a bigger component of funding higher education because higher education benefits the individual, but it doesn't only benefit yeah. the individual. It benefits all of us in a collective sense and the collective capability comes in. But the second is that it requires agency from people within the university. Yeah. This is not a matter simply for politicians to resolve. Yeah. We shouldn't simply allow politicians to put ideas on the table and then critique them. We need to be figuring what the answer is. And that is not simply about money or more grants. It's about how we function as an institution, how we reimagine the university. But that is not only, I would argue, an agency for vice chancellors, as important as we are. Mm. It's an important agency for academics. Yes. It's important for professional and services staff. It's important for students and their representatives. And it's important for unions. Our problem is we operate on a formula for the 60s, 70s, and 80s mm. when we have to reimagine what social justice means, what higher education means, what economic competitive means for the 21st century. And all of us have a role in that responsibility. Would you agree with that? I would entirely agree with that. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to add to what you said. You've captured, I think, an inspiring possibility. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think higher education, as you say, we need to take responsibility for putting forward the sorts of things that we think would help, mm. not sort of saying, we're wonderful, give us money, which mm. has sort of been the historic model, and it, it ought to be dead as a dodo. That's, a, it seems to be, a wonderful place to conclude this conversation. As, Sh as Shitty just said, we will be going to an election on the 4th of July, and there's going to be a lot of silly debate. We have seen it in recent weeks, and I'm sure it's going to get even worse in the coming weeks. But this is a moment for leadership, a moment for leadership in an incredibly polarized world and an incredibly
polarized society uh, with many public institutions not working as they should. And in that moment, we need to rely less on the rhetoric, more on thinking deeply amongst all of ourselves on how to reimagine our world, reimagine our public institutions, reimagine the financing of our public institutions, reimagining how we engage in a broader world so we can cohere a global community. But in many ways, the universities should reimagine what the world should be. Mm. And I think that what I think we started doing is starting to say, yes, what we should restructure. I don't think we found complete answers, but we're saying that we could reimagine, that we do need to reimagine, and frankly, we shouldn't let institutional boundaries to prevent us from thinking beyond existing parameters. So my thanks to you, Nicholas. My thanks to you, Shitij. Pleasure. Thank you for coming over to SOAS, and thank you to the audience, as always, for being part of our community of learning. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>